1954, in the tiny village of Oku on Shikoku Island in the south of Japan, Suji Nakamura was born. One of four children, his interest in science grew from his connection with the natural world around him. Nature was so beautiful. At the every day I went to the beach and the whole day I, I played the beach with many, many friends. I was always uh, watching uh, a lot of nature carefully. I had a lot of questions and uh, at the time uh, always thinking about very deeply why the nature is like this. And so uh, gradually I became my, my uh, dream became uh, I wanted to become a scientist in the future. And also at the same time I like to read uh, comic books. And in Japan at that time, famous comic book is name is Iron Atom, and uh, some scientists invented a robot, like a human robot, fight against the bad guys. And uh, so I gradually, oh, I, I want to become a scientist who can make a robot. So, so my dream is a scientist. It's surprising to think that Suji almost didn't get the chance to attend high school. It's a small village, and there's a, only elementary school and the junior high school. There are no high school or no university at all. Nobody could go to high school because a very poor city because the uh, main job was uh, fishing and agriculture. So nobody could become an engineering scientist at the time. But in my case, luckily, I moved to the big city at uh, second grade elementary school. Following his interest as a young man, he attended the University of Tokushima some six hours away on the other side of Shikoku and graduated in 1977 with a degree in electrical engineering. He was then hired as an engineer at Nichia Corporation. Nichia's specialty at that time was making the phosphorus for fluorescent lamps, the substance that glows and gives off the light in a fluorescent tube. They also specialized in the phosphorus for color television screens. However, Suji saw the great potential of LEDs and wanted to start research in blue LED development. In the field of LED, biggest problem is uh, no blue LED. If people can develop blue and green, there would be a huge market for LED. Gradually, after reading papers, and oh, I want to develop you know, blue and green LED. And I asked for my boss after joining a company immediately, so I want to develop blue and green LED. And she said, no, you are crazy, you know. Do you know my company? My company is a small company, you know. No budget, and uh, also you graduate uh, local university, uh, Tokushima University, Tokushima University. <laughs> Tokushima University is uh, uh, not, uh, not top, uh, less than middle, you know, just, uh, yeah, not uh, Dunkin' is very bad. So you are not smart. So, so both said uh, you are crazy. And I said, okay, no, no way. <laughs> I gave up, so. Around that time, LEDs were gaining interest in being used as a light source over traditional incandescent lighting. An incandescent bulb is not a light-emitting source. It's actually a heater that happens to put out light. And so 94% of um, the energy that goes into an incandescent bulb actually puts out heat. And the small percentage that uh, puts out light is what we see and use. So it has always been the desire of mankind to actually, yes, thank Edison for his invention, but move past it as quickly as possible. And so what we really want is we want to convert electrical energy into light, not heat and have light as a byproduct. By contrast, LEDs only heat up electrons enough to move the electrons between two different materials in a semiconductor which releases photons of light with up to four times more efficiency than incandescent sources. A simple phenomenon once it was understood, but the journey from the first LEDs to practical LEDs was a technical challenge. To make an LED, you need a certain kind of a semiconductor that can put out light. Silicon, which dominates the semiconductor world, cannot put out light. The goal always was to make visible light. In fact, the infrared LED morphed into the red LED and actually Steve Denbars, another one of our illustrious colleagues here, was one of the key players in making the red LED the successful LED that it is today. Really the first LED, uh, visible LED, was a red LED that was actually invented in 1962 and it really was a materials breakthrough. So the key breakthrough is to find the right alloy or the right material that emitted red light. So he found that in, in 1962, and then 
you know, that stuff started appearing in these uh, watches, uh, Seiko watches and stuff. It was very expensive. That's why it was very limited for, you know, a couple, almost two decades. Um, but I kind of stopped at red. Uh, so the, the thing that was missing was the, to complete the color spectrum was blue. So, you know, if you only have the color red and, and then their green came on and it also was, was not so bright. Um, so if you're limited to red and green, you can't really make full color applications. And so that kept LEDs pretty much relegated to indicator industries, what I call indicator lights on computers or red traffic signals. So we didn't have the widespread applications yet until we, we got to blue, which didn't happen until the 90s. One of the earliest consumer uses of LEDs was in calculators of the late 70s, which necessitated the use of magnifying lenses over the LEDs so the tiny, characteristically rosy red display was visible. But the development of LEDs continued, and eventually the red LED was joined by other colors. But a bright white LED still proved to be elusive. At Nichia, Suji finally saw his chance to work on the development of the blue LED. I went to the uh, company's uh, chairman's office directly, so I want to do work for the to develop the blue LEDs. And uh, if you cannot allow me to uh, develop blue LEDs, I, I, I immediately I quit the company, you know, <laughs> because uh, there are no room for me. So, and he said, yes, it's okay. And uh, I was so surprised because uh, he allowed me to work for blue LEDs. Suji believed the key to success of a blue LED light was a material called gallium nitride, but developing on gallium nitride proved to be a difficult material to work with. Most of the industry had given up on gallium nitride. It was so difficult to develop that eventually even Nichia ordered Suji to stop his work with gallium nitride because it was costing too much time and money. Well, gallium nitride is a very difficult semiconductor. It does not occur naturally in nature. Diamond occurs naturally in nature. So given, uh, given Earth enough time, it produced a diamond. But given Earth enough time, it did not produce gallium nitride. So it's obviously something mankind had to develop. It's a truly man-made material. Gallium nitride was a very difficult material to grow because it, it requires very high temperatures and higher pressures than the other materials I was growing in the lab. Particularly the higher temperatures, it, it requires about 1,000 degrees Celsius. So this is very hot. Uh, you know, your typical oven that you use at home only goes up to about uh, three, 400 Celsius. Um, you know, so this is like 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so things are glowing pretty bright red, and so things were breaking, glass was melting, the rubber was melting. So literally it was redesigning the equipment to work at these high temperatures. But Suji was convinced of its potential and continued his work with gallium nitride. Then in 1993, Suji and his group had a breakthrough. By coming to understand the physics of the material, they found the process to unlock its true world-changing potential. Next time on Lighting the World, Unleashing the Light.